I hope you guys are enjoying uh, DPLA and our lovely spring Chicago weather, for those of you who are visiting us uh, from, uh, from other places. Um, you're lucky you weren't here over the weekend, though, because I'm sure you've all heard if you uh, weren't here as we had snow. So um, at least it's just a little bit of drizzle. Um, I am going to introduce um, our uh, distinguished uh, speakers this, uh, this afternoon. Um, Luis Renard is the director of the Museum of the Obama Presidential Center and um, also a new collaborator of the Chicago Public Library. We were thrilled to announce about a year ago that uh, we'll be embedding a, a neighborhood library within the center. So we're getting to know each other a little bit. But Louise is from um, uh, Northern England and she attended, uh, she studied African American uh, film and theater and drama at, uh, at Britain's University of Manchester and came to the United States and um, and did her PhD uh, at Yale in African American studies. She's done all kinds of things from curating to um, uh, writing. Uh, she has um, uh, most recently came to Chicago from the New York Public Library where she was a curator for a short period of time and is now uh, traveling all over the country, all over the world, uh, preparing for um, opening this incredible new museum that will be here in Chicago. Um, Eric Kleinberg uh, will be in conversation uh, with uh, Luis today. And she, he's a professor of sociology and the director of the Institute of Public Knowledge at New York University, and he's an author of many award-winning books, um, uh, most recently, Palace for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight in Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life. Uh, so we're going to hear from him as well. Um, he's also the editor um, of Cultural Production uh, in a Digital Age and a journal um, of pop culture, um, and he's... Uh, been published in many uh, esteemed publications, including the New Yorker, New York Times, New York Magazine, Rolling Stone, uh, Time, Fortune, Wall Street, you get the, get the picture. He's, he's been writing a lot and uh, saying really interesting things, so we're excited to have him here. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. I think, are these on? Can you hear me okay? Hello, everyone. I have to say, the last time I was up here was 2002. It was the first book talk I ever gave my entire life. And I was so nervous, I could hardly hold my book during that whole, whole event. I remember like trembling for two hours. I feel much more calm being with you guys here today. Well, I haven't started asking you questions yet. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, earlier in the, the conference, we actually, we had the mayor here, and he was talking about the, the bridging of the digital and the, the physical spaces. I'm curious if you both could talk a little bit about your ideas about how you build a physical civic space in a digital era. Shall I take the yeah. lead here? Okay, I'll make a stab at that um, question. Thank you, Brian. Um, as Brian mentioned, I'm the founding director of the Museum of the Obama Presidential Center, which will be here in Chicago, uh, rooted very locally on the south side in Jackson Park. And so we are thinking um, in the most foundational sense of what it means to literally build a civic space. And I think in terms of the kind of digital world in which we live, there is a natural synergy, and it is very much about finding equilibrium and balance between the two. And I say that in terms of the museum being a physical experience, and we think a lot about the experiential planning for a museum. There's something interesting about communing with objects, with the physical artifact, and the way in which objects, that physical materiality, helps to tell a story. So there's that aspect of the experience. But we understand that there's also a digital ecosystem that effectively envelopes that experience and importantly connects people across spaces as well as across time. I mean, the way in which we can use technology to really think about um, how history can be shaped and conveyed. So I'll pause there and, and hand to Eric, but I think it's very much about the connection between the two. There's a fluidity mm. between the two. I, I think that's great and right, and, and I guess it's inescapable that there be that fluidity because the fact is that, tell me if I'm not speaking for you here, but I find that I'm spending more and more of my time just scrolling up and down on a screen. Did anyone have that experience in the world? And, and uh, Apparently there was some report that came out this morning. I'm guessing some of you have been scrolling up and down <laughs> to try to find out stuff about that too. And, and so what I experience and what I think really matters for, for libraries and public institutions is that while on the one hand we have become, I hate to use the word, but addicted to these devices and we can't get ourselves off the screens, on the other hand 
what I'm observing is this kind of reckoning uh, with the downfalls of spending our lives this way. And I have seen uh, across this country and around the world a real hunger for an analog life, you know, a, a mm. real gathering places where people can confront each other as if we were actual human beings in a room together. Um, I started doing this thing recently where I would go do talks and I would say, like, we're going to have a no technology talk. I will use no PowerPoints. Please put your phones away. Let's just be together in a room, like, you know, like we used to. And it's amazing what happens. And so I, I actually think the potential for developing real gathering places in the digital world is massive because I think people need it. And then I think there's all kinds of ways that uh, designers can make places attractive and inviting and welcoming. And one of the really special things about a library is that like, if you and your buddy go to meet a third person in a library and your friend is 10 minutes late and you happen to be African American, no one is going to arrest you in the library for waiting around for that kind of place, right? So, so uh, uh, yeah. I think, it's, I, I personally, I think the library deserves more than that kind of applause. But you know, <laughs> it's at the end of a long conference. I mean, so I think, uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is accessibility really matters. Yeah. It's important to have it be beautiful. It's important to have it be welcoming. But it, it needs to be accessible as a matter of principle. And then the one other beautiful thing about libraries is that, uh, generally speaking. Uh, you know, local leaders and, and kind of library administrators have tremendous capacity to shape a place, a physical place, so that it meets the, the needs and preferences of the people who live around it. Um, and I hope that we can maintain that uh, in the future as well. So Eric, just a follow-up question. Um, in, you gave some good general examples of, of libraries sort of bridging the digital and physical world. Can you give a, a more specific example? It could be libraries or somewhere else where you've seen this done well. So my favorite example of this uh, is from the Brooklyn Public Library. Is it anyone here from Brooklyn? All right. Brooklyn is everywhere. You can always tell because whenever you see like a big long beard, you know, that's, it's, that's likely to be Brooklyn. Brooklyn's responsible for the $9 ice cream cone. Thank you, Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> You know, the places where the only flavor is salt. Uh, so, so but, but Brooklyn, despite those problems, like the, the, the amazing thing that I saw in Brooklyn is, okay, Brooklyn, like Chicago, like many other cities, has this enormous population of older people who are, you know, aging in place and in, in many cases now aging alone. And there's a real issue in this world we live in now, which is the, the kind of rising um, uh, risk of social isolation and loneliness and disconnection and it's a kind of public health issue and quality of life issue that it's very difficult for us to reckon with. And you know, libraries have the capacity to really intervene here by creating programming that's inviting and welcoming and dynamic and interesting so that older people uh, have a capacity for social engagement and civic engagement that's more than just the kind of geriatric ghetto experience you have in a senior center. Mm. And, and the administrators in Brooklyn figured this out and they created this program called Library Lanes which I write about uh, in my book. And the Library Lanes program works like this. Uh, older people are invited to go to branch libraries throughout Brooklyn where they form teams, they form bowling league teams. Uh, they get bowling jerseys. And once a week, they gather in kind of the co whatever common room they have in the branch library. And they plug a, a tele, a, a, like a, a, a Wii or a, Xbox into a television set, and then they have a virtual bowling competition where the branch teams compete against one another while wearing these outfits. And I, I spent time in these places, and like, I grew up in Chicago. I used to go to the United Center, the Chicago Stadium, when the Michael Jordan was rocking the house, and uh, the like, Game 7 against the Pistons was happening, and nothing was as exciting as watching the East New York, you know, library bowling league uh, take on their neighbors. It like sociologists talk about collective effervescence. It was amazing to see, and I have photographs of this in, in the book as well. Like the faces of people who have every reason to be home, alone, lonely, out of touch with each other, in, engage in this incredibly dynamic social situation that's got a physical place and digital media coming together. And every library system should have that. So a similar question for you. I mean, thinking about um, how you're imagining doing this in the Obama Presidential Center, maybe uh, virtual uh, basketball leagues uh, as a nod to Obama. No, but, um, but how are you thinking about managing sort of this question of 
uh, creating uh, a robust digital community as well as a physical community and connecting those two places. Yeah, I was just thinking it's very much not about bowling alone, right? That, that general sense of, of bringing people together around a core goal. Um, and, and to energize So glad somebody people. got that reference, by the way. So. Oh. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and to really energize people. Um, so we do think about the physical space itself, as I mentioned. Uh, there's the museum building, which is telling a very particular story. It is itself a platform for civic engagement, which I think is central to our mission which is to inspire, empower, and to connect people to change their world. And so to really think about how change and innovation is incremental, it can be a very small thing, it can be a grand gesture, you know, this desire of a young child on the South Side to become president of the United mm -hmm. States is, is certainly one piece of that story. Helping people to understand how they are, in fact, social actors within history itself, that history is something that we are all collectively creating. It is a construction that can shift and change over time. And so really thinking about this long sense um, of American progressive movements and milestones. So that's one particular story that we're telling. But part of that is about the connection between individual agency and collective action. It obviously goes back to the president, President Obama's kind of foundational experience in community organizing here in Chicago. And then thinking about how that activity comes to life within physical programming spaces, all of the kind of programming work that the Obama Foundation is undertaking both locally, nationally, and internationally. And then wedding that to that third space of the library, yeah. uh, this third space of uh, circulation, a production of knowledge, which is then shared. So you have a really interesting synergy again between museum, which is telling a particular sense of history as it's also engaged with the present and the future, connecting that to very literal action, but then thinking about the space of the library as sharing information and the importance yeah. of sharing information, the circulation of knowledge. Uh, and, and within that, there is literally the democratic space making of, for example, a plaza. And I think in terms of the bowling example, also just thinking broadly about wellness, about bringing people together to do yoga or tai chi or whatever that engaging activity can be for people across ages. And I think, again, the intergenerational sense of libraries is really key. And then thinking about the landscape it's, itself, and then thinking about the platform of the digital. So again, to imagine a child in a classroom on the south side being able to speak to a peer in Nairobi, in Honolulu, in Jakarta, uh, and really thinking about how technology can engage around curricula, uh, a curriculum which is about civic engagement, active engagement in democratic systems. Um, so that is very much about being able to reach people beyond the physical locus of that particular space and its deep rootedness in Chicago, just this phenomenal story that is a history that is led through that space, but constantly about action, activity. And I say that because I think many people still often think that museums are these kinds of time capsules, right, and, and that they're musty mausoleums that only speak back to a particular kind of past. But the library, the archive, is a living, breathing, social, cultural institution. Uh, and so I think being able to help people understand the connections between those spaces is the work that we'll be doing. Wow, that's incredible. Um, we are here at DPLA, um, and DPLA is obviously a big part of what we are as a national digital library. And so I'm actually curious, Eric, from your perspective, when you think about um, creating democratic spaces exclusively in the digital world, um, you know, how might we do a better job of that? Uh, if we are constrained by the fact we don't have a physical place, uh, how do we create a, a more democratic uh, uh, digital environment uh, for people to participate? It's, it's so interesting. It's, it's actually very hard for me to think about a digital space that doesn't have a physical component to it. I think of the things as being so intertwined. Um, if, if I had to remove the, the, that kind of physical world altogether and I, it's just you know, a person and a screen, mm -hmm. what are the kind of access points that we have to deal with? <laughs> Clearly, we, re we continue to have issues about the digital divide in this country that seem very old and like 1990s, but are just as relevant as they always have been. Uh, access is an issue, uh, you know, data and the cost of data is an issue, and the kind of 
basic literacy of you know how do you take advantage of the affordances that the internet provides that those those things remain um, and it's you know I, I get concerned the kind of policy wonk in me that these things have fallen off of our policy agenda yeah. as we moved on to you know futuristic concerns about things like 5g um, so you know I'm, 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 I am very concerned about access and I guess I'm also concerned the same way that I'm, uh, I'm interested in the design of physical places and, and think it's really important that we understand the, the features of physical places that allow them to be accessible and welcoming, yeah. um, that we do that in the, in the internet as well, that, that, you know, that we think about you know, what different apps look like and how they uh, can be inviting to some people but alienating to others. And there's a whole host of issues there. So I guess, the, I guess my reaction to that is to say that uh, as more and more of our activities move into this digital space that mm -hmm. we retain our core concern about the um, about democratic access yeah. and and I and I do fear that we're losing some of that so in a similar vein uh, at the at the Obama presidential center you have made a decision not to host the actual archival papers of the president in fact they're going to be completely digitized and located at the National Archive can you talk a little bit about that decision uh, to not bring the objects to the physical space and what opportunities um, and challenges that might bring to the center. Yeah, and I think it does immediately track back to the issue of accessibility, and also to think about President Obama as being, in many regards, the first digital president, mm -hmm. which is to say that 95% of the records produced during the administration were born digital. There were no paper equivalents for those records. So that's an amazing challenge, I think, for all as all of us in this space to really think about not necessarily a new model of the digital library because I think there is a fear that there is somehow a break with tradition and therefore that break somehow connotes an undermining of rigorous scholarship which is actually not the case. It is rather than a break the understanding of an evolution of a new model in which we have to be prepared to support this very hybrid nature in which the digital is actually outbalancing, outweighing the physical. Uh, so it was important, I think, for the foundation, again, in direct collaboration with the National Arch Archives, to think about what that new model mm. can be. Um, so digitization, in order to kind of balance the bond digital with materials that would need to be digitized, some 30 million pages, but still a fraction of the almost a billion pages wow. uh, that were produced during those eight years. And then to find a way to make those records accessible to as many people as possible, which is not to say that scholars will not, won't have access to physical records and other you know, associated materials, um, but it will have to be a naturally hybrid relationship. And I think scholars, younger scholars, have been increasingly trained in the public humanities, in the digital humanities, in understanding um, the further reach, the global reach of that work. So it's really exciting, and it goes back to yeah. people uh, like Franco Moretti thinking about distant reading as well as mm. close reading and understanding the two together. Uh, so there's huge potential. Uh, just a 30 second you know, note from a scholar who's invested in this, and it's very, this is, I find this very challenging because I accept how much of the Obama record is digital, and I, and I recognize how important it is to have a digital library system that accommodates that. And so when I was presented with uh, some criticisms of the Obama model, you know, digital more than you know, traditional and physical, I thought, this is a misunderstanding. You know, I yeah. think that, that it, w it makes sense for me that the Obama presidential library would be primarily digital. But, and here's a challenge, if you said to me, uh, hey, Eric, did you hear about the Trump presidential library? It's just going to be digital. It's going to be primarily digital. All these red flags start to run up for me um, because I think about you know how contested the kind of digital legacy of the Trump administration is, and I start to wonder like what else is going to happen. Now I'm just saying that because it reflects some bias I have. There's nothing more than that. You know, uh, I have an anxiety about one of these guys, and less uh, less in terms of information and access than the other. And so I don't have an answer, but I think as we debate, and, and, and I'm fine with the Obama library working this way, but I think as we project ourselves forward, we're going to face questions like this that we're going to have to process uh, and debate democratically. So you're suggesting we print out all of his tweets, is that what you're saying? <laughs> and digitize those. I can provide a quick answer, I yeah. think, in terms of concerns about yeah. future administrations. Yeah. 
um, is that the records still belong to the National Archives. They are the custodians, they are the stewards of that library, regardless of the president. And I think that is the wonderful unifier uh, in terms of their oversight and their ownership of, of those records. So I think we're in good hands. Uh, with the National Archives. You, you're looking <laughs> skeptical. I mean, the idea that we're in good hands today is so far-fetched to me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, run, I, I'm gonna run with it anyway. Uh, I'm gonna take a uh, dial back just a little bit. I mentioned before that um, we had, uh, the mayor of Chicago came and talked a bit about sort of his vision for libraries and uh, probably his last, uh, as, as mayor, uh, sort of public address about the importance of libraries in cities. And um, it, when I introduced him, I, I, I shared with the folk, you know, shared with the audience that there's really not a lot of mayors out there these days touting the importance um, of institutions such as libraries and museums. Um, can, can, can the two of you sort of uh, talk a little bit about why you think um, that is and how we might, as a community, um, better engage uh, our uh, political systems to, to better support and invest in these institutions? Well, look, I, you know, the, I wrote this book, I think, in part because I, I really wanted to make the case, you know, not only for the library, but also for these things I call social infrastructure more generally, um, and, and public goods, gathering places that I see as essential to the health of our civil society. From, you know, as essential as the ordinary set of critical infrastructures power, water, transit, things like that. I mean, I, I really do believe that if we don't have adequate gathering places that are open and accessible and maintained and welcoming, that we will start to, we will lose uh, the, the foundations of uh, an open society. And so I see this as essential, and my, my book is an argument for this. And, you know, f f from, the, what we, from what I've seen, uh, watching, you know, mayor after mayor cut the library budget, um, I, 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 I believe there's a kind of failure to understand just how many vital activities happen inside libraries that are different from borrowing books. And it's frustrating because libraries have, have changed for a long time, have been doing things different for a long time. Um, but I see across elite sectors of the United States, whether it's you know uh, the private sector or philanthropy uh, or you know, sadly, go government, uh, this misrecognition. Mm -hmm. And there is an impression, I think, uh, that libraries are luxuries. They're nice to have when you have some extra money to support, um, but that they are less urgent and necessary than other institutions. And so, you know, when, when the local government has some extra funding, yeah, they can throw some money at libraries. Um, uh, but during tough times, it, libraries often lose out. And, you know, I'm, I'm from New York City, and if any of you guys have been to New York City recently, you might have noticed that the subway kind of sucks now. And, um, and in fact, you know, the, the, it, it turns out that the average uh, subway ran faster 70 years ago than it runs today. Wow. And isn't that amazing? Um, it, it literally runs more slowly today. And in a way, the situation with the library is similar. Um, the, you know, the most popular day of the week in the New York City public library system used to be Sundays because, you know, a lot of people didn't work and families could be together. And it's like, what better to do on a Sunday than take your family to the library and be together and be with your neighbors and improve yourself and learn things. The libraries are basically closed on Sundays, you know, not just in New York City, but all over the country. And libraries used to have open hours that were late, and now they are oftentimes closed, you know, soon after dinner time. And so if you have a nine to five kind of job and other obligations, you will not spend time in a library. And if you think about all the things that um, libraries do for us, and I'm not gonna tell you because you know this, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a profound uh, shame. Uh, and al almost a disgrace that we have failed to recognize this institution. And so, uh, y you know, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do basically what the librarians of the world did last year when that Forbes article by The Economist saying that libraries should be knocked down and replaced with Amazon stores. Uh, <laughs> do you remember that article, the Forbes piece? No. So, oh, so, so, no. <laughs> nah? I'm, it's like, that's the only thing we talk about, Eric. <laughs> uh, Right, because like librarians got on Twitter and went everywhere in public and made these kind of public testimonies to the um, extraordinary things that happened in libraries and basically won 
Like they, they won the internet so hard that like Forbes took the article down. And, and the, but the mistake, but the, so it, that was awesome. But the mistake is that then it was like, okay, high five, high five, high five, you know, it's down. But that, that fight is happening every day. You know, we, we have to make the case collectively. Um, and I think we, we have the will to do it. I think it's just, um, it, it, it requires uh, a kind of a constant push and, and enthusiasm. So Luis, for you, um, I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts on this, but also you're in a unique spot in the fact that you've worked in public libraries, you work, you're, you're an academic, and you also work for an organization where you just decided to put a library, a public library within the center, the first of its kind. So you, can you talk about sort of the, um, uh, from a similar vantage point, where you think the disconnect might be, and then how was it that you came to the decision to actually embed a public library within the center? Uh, yeah, it's interesting to think back to the idea of agency, I think, um, in terms of, I mean, Eric, you speak of palaces for the people and, and this kind of bestowing upon the people of these social spaces. Um, but we know that people make up libraries, right? So it, it, it's about the books, it's about the circulation of knowledge. Um, but these are civic spaces which are literally energized by humans, by individuals. And just thinking about Susan O'Leon's amazing book um, about the library and the Los Angeles Public Library, and just the amazingly kind of compelling stories that come out of that particular space. So it is about people, and I think it's about engaging people around democratic process to speak out mm -hmm. boldly for their needs, that these are truly civic amenities. Uh, as well as places of exposure and inspiration and uplift and excitement. Um, and so we can't lose sight of that. I think it has a lot to do with the human sensorium, the, the desire to see and to smell and to feel part of this particular space, and that is the convening of people. Um, but again, to go back to librarians who were speaking um, powerfully about their roles in the world uh, and engaging everyday citizens to do the same and to make those demands on the people who can actually make change, uh, I think is critical. So there's certainly that piece of, of the conversation. And then for the Obama Presidential Center, again, just a wonderful fit, uh, thinking about the work that we're doing around civic engagement, uh, thinking about the story that we're telling of a, a president who was himself a writer, is a writer, uh, and not just in the traditional sense of the post-presidential memoir, but really, truly a writer who's coming into himself uh, through the production of, of you know, um, such a key memoir. Uh, and so thinking about his work, thinking about him as reader, writer, thinker, uh, Mrs. Obama in terms of becoming and what a phenomenon that is, again, engaging people around a book. I mean, it's truly central to who they are. So it's very much about the Obama ethos. Uh, and then unpacking, again, this traditional notion of a presidential library, a presidential archive, understanding how we could open up the physical footprint of this space to as many people as possible. And how do you do that? You have a branch of the Chicago Public Library at the center. And again, it really opens up the idea of a center, a campus, not as this enclosed space, but as a kind of commons. And I think of the public library doing the work of a civic commons. Uh, I'm sad to say I was not part of the decision making. I hadn't arrived at the foundation when that decision was made. But it's been wonderful to think through um, all the possibilities of this collaboration. Well, we've actually reached our time, so I want to thank you both. I know it was, I feel like we're just getting started, but um, thank you both and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brian. This live? Good. I get the fun job, I get to try and wrap up an incredible couple of days. So I hope through the voice of myself, you'll hear yourself, you'll hear those who are sitting to the left and the right of you, and you'll feel an emotion that I felt after spending the last you know, 18, 24 hours in Chicago with probably one of the most interesting, dynamic group of people that I could ever imagine. I have to say first, from the perspective of Brian, thanks for hosting us here at your wonderful Library. I was reminded of some fun things you and I have done socially, putting on a wetsuit and swimming out to a cold water island, dodging sharks. But John Bracken, this is your event. You pulled this group together <laughs> by sheer force of personality. 
I think when I first met you in ALA, uh, you had just accepted the job, and I jotted down a couple of my first impressions. I thought you were very well connected. You knew people that I didn't even know. You're passionate. You're impatient. You don't want to wait for change to come to you. You want to be there reaching it at the door. You have an insatiable curiosity. And I think most of all, you're committed. You're committed to the cause. You're committed to the community here. And you did, by your example, I think, really drove me back to reassess where I am with the contribution I'm trying to make back to the community. The community. I asked a couple of people for comments, thoughts, observations. How would they distill the past couple of days? One person said, this is the first time I've seen this community really coalesce. I like that word, coalesce. The one I got a big kick out of was someone said, this changed my life. I said, well, that's kind of bold. But then I started thinking back about it. And maybe in a way it has changed my life. I think we've pushed boundaries in this discussion. We heard a woman named Ashlyn talk about gamification and the impact of rethinking life through a game. And I saw a lot of heads nodding and people leaning forward during that conversation. Catherine, Wikimedia. My God, what a responsibility we have to help support an organization, an institution like that. Trusted knowledge. It's not an oxymoron. It's part of what we do in our position here. We talked about scale, uh, how to work better together. I personally have a horse in that race with the relationship we have with DPLA, Lyricist, and New York Public Library, trying to take on something as challenging, important, and really humbling as a reading experience. I think we all have those moments as we think back over the last couple of days of something that resonated with us. We're not alone as we go down this path and this journey as I look out across the friends and colleagues and people that I've met over the last couple of days. Cliff Lynch representing CNI, a really august institution that he's been pursuing for 20 years to help challenge us and push us forward. Dorn Weber, one of our fiscal stewards, looking out and trying to pervert present and insert capital into the process to help us take that change and go that, make that challenge as we go forward. I think at the end of the day, we gave ourselves over the last couple days permission to change. I think at the end of the day, we now know how to accelerate that change by ideas we've heard, relationships we've made, and the community that we're a part of. I think we're doing this together. We're not doing it alone. And that gives me confidence, and it gives me hope. Not quite unlike David and Goliath, but in some ways, I think we're the Goliath. Maybe we've always looked at ourselves as the David. I think we're both. So at the end of the day, this is your DPLA. It's what you and we want to make of it. I asked John this morning, I said, if there was one message you'd like me to leave with the group, what would it be? He didn't even hesitate. And he said, we will only succeed when our partners and our members succeed. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being a part of this. I'd like to hand the microphone over to John Bradley. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, um, great. Well, so a couple of things to say. Robert, thank you, and thank you, Lyricist, for being such great partners for DPLA now and forever. And can we thank again uh, Brian, Eric, and Louise? That was great. Thank you so much. Um, so we want, as Robert suggests, we want to keep this going. We want to your input as we begin the, the DPLA team is going to blanch as we get, begin to plan for the next DPLA Fest. So while you're sitting here and while I catch you up on a couple of thank yous, I'd love for you to go here and share with us what you were excited about, what you wanted to see more or less of while we're talking. We want to gather your input while it's fresh. Um, also, a handful of you walked in, when you walked in just now, you were handed note cards. Who, who got a little note card that says palaces with people? One, two, three. Um, you all are lucky winners. Eric Kleinberg's book is yours when you walk out of here. Claim it at the... At the um, at the desk when you come in, yes, Palace of the People, and you'll have the chance to get it signed upstairs during lunch. Those of you who didn't get an envelope, which I will say were, were randomly handed out, um, our friends from City Lit Bookstores will be upstairs selling books uh, during lunch, so look for that. Um,
I want to take a moment to thank someone who's been uh, an incredible friend for the entire field for a long time, who's been essential to the formation of the Digital Public Library of America, and has become a good friend of mine in my first 15 months here on the job. Um, Valerie, this, the last year would have been impossible without you. Valerie's also been core to our, the advisory council that we've had. Valerie's retiring uh, in a few weeks. Um, and I just want to say thank you on behalf of DPLA and a grateful field. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for us and for everyone. And I want to give you this book. This is, so this is my, my daughter's favorite book. It's called Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. And Valerie is a rebel. So the day's not over. This is sort of, this is the last time we're all going to be in a room together. But sessions start up, as soon as I finish with my spiel, we'll have lunch. Sessions start up again at 1.45, including two that are not listed in your printed program, though they're, they're in your digital program. Uh, Matt Zumwalt is doing a talk about the decentralized web, a primer about the decentralized web at 1.45 in South Hall. Um, and then also doing a deeper dive workshop around the decentralized web at 3 o'clock, which is in what room? Do we know? The Decentralized Web, 3 o'clock? Also in the South Hall. Um, and the library is, it's a public library. So uh, we, I hope you, those of you that need to hang, want to hang out and continue to talk and have conversations after the last sessions, where we can do so. And the rooms, I think we've reserved for the rest of the day, the ones that we've been using. Um, I want to thank you, thank again all the sponsors who have made today possible. Um, and you know, we wouldn't have been able to do the fest without you. This is the first time we've sought, and s sought help uh, from outside forces for running this. Chris, Jessica, Annie, Nina, Julie, Hannah, everyone from Hoopla, you guys have been awesome. Uh, uh, you know, r working, with, uh, working with us, especially a virtual organization, running a, running a conference from afar from the last few months can't be easy, and you guys have made it look easy, and you've been a pleasure to work with. So thank you so much. And you, the whole Hoopla team has been awesome. We've had almost three dozen of you working as volunteers helping make this operation work, too. Those of you who have been volunteers, many of you are out in the hallway working, but those of you who have volunteered, would you raise your hands, please, so we can thank you for being volunteers. All of the CPL staff, uh, especially the AV team in the back, uh, especially the, the security staff who have been corralling us and pointing us in the right directions for the last two days, thank you. And, and lastly, thank the, to my colleagues on the DPLA staff. You guys have been awesome. Um, and I, I won't gush about you too much because we've got, still got a lot of work to do. But I want to give a particular shout out to the woman who's really been driving and leading the organization on behalf of the staff for the last two, really three days. And that's Samantha Gibson. Uh, thank you, Samantha, for everything you've been telling me. Uh, and unless Chris tells me I'm missing anything else, it's lunchtime. Enjoy your final sessions, and we'll see you at the next DPLA Fest.